So thank you all so much for joining. Um, this breakout session is about events and alumni relations in a suddenly virtual world. Um, so I think we're probably in good company with a lot of events and alumni relations folks. I'm really glad that you've joined. Um, I am Lillian Bakary. I'm our Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Boston University School of Law. So I'm uh, over here in Boston. Um, it's a beautiful sunny day over here and it's like 70 degrees, it's perfect. So it's a good day. Uh, I am joined on today's panel by Jessica Merkner. Uh, she is the Director of Development at University of Oregon. Hi, Jessica. And also by Chris Monty. She's the Associate Director of Events at the Quinney College of Law at University of Utah. And I just want to start off by saying thank you so much to Chris and her team. Um, for those of us alumni relations people who've uh, held concurrent Zoom meetings, um, we, we know how difficult that is, let alone holding a whole day of them. <laughs> so thank you so much to Chris and Spencer, who's behind the scenes here, and the whole Utah Law team for making this possible. So thank you all. All right, just a few logistical points. Uh, we wanted this to be held in a meeting format rather than webinar so that it could be more interactive. We'll move into a breakout room at about the halfway mark. Um, so if you're not a panelist, just a reminder to keep yourselves muted. Looks like we all are. Uh, and uh, this is just a, a small logistical thing that we'll walk through. If you could hover your mouse over your Zoom panel, we're just going to rename ourselves uh, this will come into play when we move into breakouts later, but if you hover your mouse over your own Zoom panel, you'll see a little blue button that has three white dots, and you should have the option to rename. And let's go, just for the purposes of space, let's go with first name and institution. Let's see. I'll know this is possible if I see some name changes here. Yep, looks good. All right. I guess I should follow my own rules here. Okay. So once we've all renamed ourselves with first name and institution, like I said, that will come into play when we move into breakouts. Um, if you just want to move into speaker view, it should uh, just show whoever's speaking and I might make a more pleasant viewing experience for y'all. All right, so just a quick overview of how the call is going to go. Jessica, myself, and uh, Chris, we are all going to give about five to 10 minutes update as to what we've done since March, what's worked well and what hasn't. Uh, then we're going to move into a breakout session for about 15 minutes. Um, we'll work through some questions that I'll post in the chat. There will be about six of us per breakout session. And then we will come back for the last 15 minutes and we'll have some open Q&A. We hope that it can be really interactive. So we, we want to hear from all of you. All right, uh, so I will uh, we'll kick us off here. Um, so building community and growing relationships in a time when we're unable to gather in person. Um, as we all know on this call, this is no easy task, right? Um, so uh, I'll go through what we've done at Boston University School of Law uh, since March, um, and uh, I'll give you some details about what's worked well. Full disclaimer, there are many things that haven't worked well. I might not cover those as much um, in, in this next five to 10 minutes, but I'm happy to speak uh, to some of that afterwards if you'd like to follow up. So uh, we've held over 30 virtual gatherings at BU Law since March, which is a lot. Um, they've mostly fallen into one of three categories. Uh, we've had leadership gatherings, so we've invited our alumni who serve on a committee or board or in another leadership uh, fashion together. Uh, we've also held a number of virtual happy hours and social gatherings, and we've also held webinars that have had educational content. So I'll, I'll move through some details of, of these three buckets of events that we've gone through. Um, so when COVID hit in early March, I was just reflecting on this time because it feels like 15 years ago, um, I was hit with a wave of panic, of course, like all of us, you know, per personally and professionally. Um, and I knew that it was one of these poignant moments in history when uh, 
people would remember what BU law did or didn't say or did or didn't do. And uh, there was huge pressure on that moment that I think we can all remember. Um, you know, we were all unraveling months of work. We were in the midst of canceling our big annual reunion weekend, which was really stressful. Um, and wondering what we could turn virtual, what we should turn virtual. Um, and essentially what happened was that I uh, fought some paralysis that I was having and I just decided we had to do something. Um, and so I, I asked myself where we were gonna be, begin. Um, so I reflected on times of crisis in, in my personal life and uh, recalled that, you know, in, in times of uh, personal crisis, I rally my people around me, right? Like I get my support group going for counsel uh, and support. So we decided to do much the same with our alumni at BU Law. So within that first week of BU deciding not to bring students back from spring break, uh, I brought together leaders from my young alumni councils and our executive committee. Um, and I brought them onto a Zoom call and I basically provided an update as to what had happened. Uh, I extended this invitation to alumni who I believed had come forward as leaders uh, outside of the formal sense and invited them, basically invited them into this like inner circle that, uh, that I wanted to establish early on in this time of crisis. Um, this turned into a series of what were basically office hours with me, uh, where I would invite this alumni leadership group to join me on Zoom just for either a half an hour or an hour long call to essentially provide a, a state of the school. Um, and there were many times when my updates weren't super substantial, but at least I was bringing this group of leaders close to us early on in a time of crisis when people were pulled in so many different directions and uh, you know, bringing them into this, uh, this decision making process during a time of great upheaval. Um, so yeah, basically what I did was build uh, an alumni crisis management team. I didn't tell them that they were a part of this team formally, but in my mind, this is, this is uh, what this group of alumni leaders were. There were people that were already really invested in the school, um, but I felt it was really important to, to keep them close, especially at the beginning of this crisis. And it ended up serving us so well. Uh, our alumni leaders were, were bought into our strategy. They knew what was going on at the law school. They ended up serving as panelists on support uh, gatherings for our current and admitted students. Uh, they were champions for many of our social and educational events that came later this spring. Uh, they helped us fundraise at fiscal year end. Uh, and we've also grown our leadership committees as a result of, of them being really involved since March. Um, so I think it was a, a good move in keeping our closest people close during a time when we were all so scattered and disconnected. So once we were about three to four weeks in, so I think this brings us to mid-April, uh, I knew that we had to provide some outlets of connectivity to our broader alumni, ba alumni base. Uh, so we launched this small pilot of virtual class happy hours. And I didn't know how these would go. Um, I hadn't at this point yet joined a Zoom happy hour even with my own friends. So it was, it was really just a, a shot in the dark. Um, but these took off and they were so successful. We've had virtual ha class happy hours with 12 classes at this point, And many of them have held around two. Um, these worked really well. We moved basically to a weekly cadence. There are many weeks where we had two. Uh, we developed this really replicable but effective process for holding these. So we'd recruit a stellar alumni host to serve as our virtual host. Um, so you know the alums that love being MC or host of the party, those were our people. Um, we sent out a really creative invitation email to the class under the host's name. And then the host went into grassroots social promotion on their own social media accounts uh, to spread the word with their classmate, which was, was really effective. Um, on the call itself, I joined for the first 20 minutes just to get our virtual host settled uh, and get everyone off and running. I grab a screenshot of all uh, the smiling faces on Zoom seeing each other for the first time in a long time, which gives us some really good marketing materials after the fact. Uh, and then I let the virtual host do what they do best. Um, people have really enjoyed the, just coming together in this casual environment. And then we do a pretty strong follow-up email that includes some updates from the law school and always a soft solicitation to either 
help our students get jobs or uh, give to support student programs at BU Law. Uh, these have all been really well attended, like I said. Uh, we um, have had a number of folks who didn't attend events before join a virtual happy hour, uh, including some really highly rated prospects that were uh, previously non-responsive and have now come back into the fold, which is really great to see. Uh, so just a side note, um, when we got to the end of May, uh, when George Floyd was murdered, um, our, our law school community was really in a state of, of trauma and outrage, and we were wondering how we could use our sense of community to bring people together. Um, we had a number of virtual happy hours uh, scheduled for those next few weeks. And it just didn't seem like the right time to hold a virtual happy hour. But rather than cancel these, we worked with our virtual host to rebrand them as community gatherings. And our virtual host did a really amazing job of reaching out to their classmates and encouraging them to still come together in this spirit of open and curious, smart dialogue about difficult topics, just like they did when they were in law school. Um, and that landed really well with our virtual hosts and their classmates and people were able to come together at a time that was, um, you know, really divisive and traumatic and uh, scary for, for so many. And because those virtual happy class happy hours had that uh, flexible, more casual format, we were able to pivot on our messaging quickly and uh, make sure that we, um, you know, remained appropriate and aware of the uh, upheaval of the times that we were in. And so that covered our, our social bases. And then finally, uh, we tapped into the incredible resources of our faculty members and some prestigious alumni, and we've held monthly webinars um, so to provide our alums with some more substantive educational content. Uh, our webinar topics have ranged in uh, ranged from could better investments in public health infrastructure have prevented COVID-19 destructive impact, uh, all the way to a webinar that we held to acknowledge the uh, anniversary of the Supreme Court Obergefell decision to legalize same-sex marriage. Uh, so those webinars have covered a wide variety of topics, which have been really great. So that brings us to June, and I'm at the end of my remarks. Um, I will say uh, I'm taking a little bit of a breather just to decide how we can bring this cadence and all these uh, lessons learned from our spring into the fall uh, to provide our alumni with events that feel impactful and also interesting. Um, and uh, I will just leave with uh, the parting thought. So before I rejoined the law school, this is my second time around, I did a brief stint at a tech startup uh, that many of you may have heard of. It's called Evertrue. Um, they make software to support higher ed fundraising. And before that, I had only worked at institutions and I've only worked at uh, higher ed institutions since. So I was used to, uh, to being on bigger teams. And I will say that my time at the startup taught me to um, look at being a member of a smaller team as a strength. I think that many of us on here who are working on law school events or alumni relations teams might be a one person show or come from a small team. And uh, having that startup mindset lets you really switch your perspective. Um, you can work around some of the red tape uh, and slow moving processes that come with being a part of a larger team um, and, uh, and really like just em embrace that, that startup mindset, especially in a time when um, you know, our, our world is so different. We're in a, a time of huge change. There's a lot of upheaval going on, but there's also that silver lining of growth and being able to test things out and try new things uh, that we haven't done before at very low cost because we're not traveling and holding the usual dinners and gatherings and, uh, and galas and such that we normally would. So I encourage us all to be little mini startups uh, within our law school. It certainly at least helps uh, me have more fun with all the work that I have to do. Um, so, uh, I'll leave it there. I'm going to turn it over to my uh, good colleague, Chris. I, Chris, I think you're next up. Is that right? Um, and uh, Chris is going to talk about the very important topic of KPIs and goals and uh, how we're measuring all that we're doing in this virtual realm. And I'm wrapping it all around the school that we're here with. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Monty. Um, 
You might have received an email or two from me in the last week, I'm guessing. Uh, please don't put me in your hate mail. Anyway, um, I'm very fortunate in the position that I work in. Uh, as the uh, associate director for events, we have many roles that we do here. Our building, I mean, it's a luxury to be here because it's a brand new building. It was opened in 2015. We're LEED Platinum rated. Uh, we have function space that was specifically designed to be for events as a potential conference center, but it's also multifunctional that we can also host classes in there. And all of that is to say where we were, uh, because if you include our classrooms and study rooms, we could schedule about 30 different function spaces for an event. So we could host some large, you know, bar association conferences and such on site. Uh, my team, we wear multiple hats. Um, I'm fortunate to work with an absolutely fabulous group of people. And there's six of us on the events team, including myself. Um, we work with the College of Law departments. Uh, we have some centers uh, like an environmental law center, a biomedical center. Um, we do alumni events. Uh, we have over 30 student organizations that we help them plan all of their uh, larger events. Um, and then we host the, the meetings also. So like faculty meetings and such that require certain uh, logistical setup and food and beverage needs. All of that falls to my department to make sure that we have it together. On top of that, we also host some external events that uh, are help support the local law community and the university. If you wrap all of those together, our metric was that uh, for the last few years, we have hosted just over 800 events a year and 500 of those events are college law events and meetings. So part of what we do with these multiple roles that we play is we schedule all of the non-academic space. So the master calendar lives in our department. And then we also, uh, you know, try to, there, there, our uh, law schedule, class schedule, allows uh, an hour for lunchtime. So what that has created in the event world is that many people want to hold their event at lunchtime because that time is available. So there are days that my team will be hosting six different lunches throughout the building and be able to move through. I give you, paint you that picture so I can explain how different now our, our current situation is. Um, we immediately, in March, we focused on uh, virtual event best practices. Um, I have a new team member who, funny enough, he hasn't actually even gotten to be in the building yet. We're going to do a tour next week, hopefully. Hopefully. Anyway, um, we have a great document that I will post to the app uh, that he actually put together that is some of its reminders, but it's just looking at everybody's best practices of what you should be considering when you're moving forward with these events. Uh, moving all of our events, we have now been told that all of the College of Law events will be virtual for fall, definitely, and possibly for spring. Except we've been told to support the student organization events here in the building. We don't know what that's going to look like yet because, of course, all of this is in flux and we're just being flexible with day-to-day -day changes that occur. Uh, the other thing that my team has uh, really had to turn, turn around and focus on, uh, which I think might be different than what some of the other law schools do, is that, uh, of course, we host several CLE events. And because the building is new and we have a fabulous IT uh, and uh, the equipment to be able to stream and record all events very easily, uh, we have a large library of CLE videos. And our uh, State Bar Association has actually promoted our library to uh, the lawyers here in the state because uh, of they can get their CLE credit that they need for it. 
So when you look at events in a greater sense, what our job is, is we always question the who, the what, the where, the when. I mean, who's your target audience? What's the goal of the event? What message are you trying to communicate for the event? What is the point of the event? Uh, and then of course, where that's now moved to what software platform or you know, how are you going to host this event? And the when is, what used to be in our world as event fatigue because our students get a zillion events, uh, uh, invites to events each week. That event fatigue is now morphed into a Zoom fatigue because that everybody is feeling. All of this, the, it goes the how that we try to get are all the details we try to get. Our new challenge really is, is because we answer those questions and what we try to develop is telling our story how do you how are we going to create the guest experience how do we do that in a virtual world i mean it's it's one thing as lillian mentioned about trying to build the community and having an engagement but events typically these larger ones you were trying to build an experience that your attendees would come and you know get a refresher with your college um, our worries are always of the unknown um, right now you know your attendee technology and their knowledge of technology um, you know their internet bandwidth uh, you know they may have kids or partners that are using the internet at the same time causing issues funny enough i kind of reviewed this uh, whole presentation with my husband and i got to that part and he's like i understand why you're not sleeping at night <laughs> Anyway, um, most of this goes back to how you answer those questions is uh, it depends on your audience and how you're going to reach them. It's our knack in the event side of things to know who our audience is, what their, what certain personalities are. I can tell you with our environmental law uh, center, any of their events, the, the general audience that would come for the lunchtime lectures they are typically uh, an older crowd that you need to plan. Are they going to be able to do a Zoom meeting? Are they going to be able to do a webinar? That sort of thing. So then we have to move to, are we taking other steps to maybe reach out to these people, calling them, um, or trying new platforms or apps rather than getting you know, just into one that might be easier for them to use? Um, I know I'm running short on time here, but uh, one of the things uh, that we have done to try and address the issues that we're looking at, uh, of course, you're having to work within the constraints of the pandemic, whatever it is within your area. Um, but I still have departments who are hoping and thinking they're going to do live events in the spring. And I honestly hope that we can do something, but you don't know. And it's like, we have to have a plan A and we have to have a plan B. Um, so then also trying to maintain your expected level of consistency for the events. And with that, I'm kind of referring to like working with your communications people, um, is the branding right for the event? Is it at, lack of a better word, is it at a professional level that you want this as a repu, you know, it's reputation of your college is what this call is going to be. Or this webinar. Um, what we did is we have now taken the time to take a step back. We have a uh, strategic events uh, committee that is made up of specific leaders from departments around the college. We're looking at all of the events as a whole. Um, most of us will know how events evolve, that one department started with an event and then like year to year, the topic kind of creeps, but they can hold on to that event. And in the end, maybe that event is a better fit with another department. So we're taking the step back, looking at all of that. Where is there overlap in the different topics? Um, where can we minimize like how many we are, how many events we are putting on people? Sorry. Uh, and 
it's been really good for all these departments to come together because we have several new leaders in several of these departments and many didn't understand what all of the rest of the school was doing. The only people who would see that would be my team because we work the master calendar. And so it's been very interesting to see how we can make a better impact for the college in that sense. And that goes for the internal audience of students, staff, and faculty, and also the external audience uh, that we're trying to reach. Um, and then I pretty much, I skipped over some things, but I think that's everything. If anybody has some questions, please, uh, we will handle that in a little bit. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica. Thank you, Chris. Oh, I'm learning so much. Thank you both. Um, okay, so I am Jessica Merkner. I am the Director of Development at the University of Oregon School of Law in Eugene, Oregon. Um, um, so I'm excited to be here with all of you today. I'm going to try to quickly share some of my thoughts about the pros and cons of virtual events for alumni and donors. And then I'll tell you about a couple of tactics that we're using at Oregon Law to help us guide us through the fall towards the new year. So at Oregon Law, we're a small development team of four, focused primarily on fundraising, of course. We do not have a dedicated alumni relations professional at the law school, um, but each of us has some alumni relations responsibilities regarding events, volunteers, and board management. Um, so I think, you know, your startup mindset, Lillian, is, is now in my, my brain to communicate back to my team. Um, so apart from the obvious benefits of virtual alumni events, um, in my mind, such as no catering, no room rental fees, no travel costs, and probably decreased printing and mailing costs, there are some aspects to virtual alumni events that we've really come to appreciate. Um, first, the geographic barriers are gone. Here in Eugene, um, reaching out, reaching alumni that wouldn't uh, normally attend our events is a definite plus in the virtual space. In fact, we've had more attendees than we might otherwise have had in person. We've also attracted non-alumni, non-lawyers to our virtual events, including students, university employees, and even prospective students. At the same time, um, at the law school and at the Greater University of Oregon, we've learned that we have about a 30 to 40 percent attrition rate from registrants to those who actually attend. So now that we've learned that we can expect this, we can be better prepared. Um, and even if there are no shows, these are alumni and friends who still have expressed um, that they're interested in what we have to offer, which I think is great. This has also been a time to partner um, more strongly with other departments. Our law school marketing and communications team loves to promote our virtual events on social media, which helps with registrations as well as promoting positive alumni relations. Posting the event to YouTube after the event concludes also has made the ultimate event turnout um, even stronger. Our university partners are proving to be helpful as well. The University of Oregon Alumni Association is promoting our events to their large e-newsletter listserv that reaches 90,000 people. Um, and to their popular social media channels. In advancement at U of O, our partners in prospect research are looking closely at registrants and attendees for prospective donors for us too. Uh, we're seeing some improvements to our data by holding these virtual events, especially, we're especially grateful to have updated email addresses and other contact information when all is said and done. I am happy to share that conducting our virtual events has provided an opportunity to help our older alumni with technology. For example, uh, we assisted our retired and less tech savvy board members with learning how to use Zoom for our spring board meeting, which they really appreciated. We also helped a few of our older donors with lessons on how to do video calls. This has provided some extra special individualized cultivation for some of our best volunteers and donors during these trying times. So we're concerned about some other things moving forward at Oregon Law. Um, we do not have a large fundraising gala that we rely on, um, but we are concerned about our revenue generating events. Registrations, donations, and sponsorships are all at risk. There's really no satisfactory substitute for our alumni awards dinner that we have during our fall kickoff each year. Fall kickoff is our version of our alumni reunion celebration. So how do we manage our alumni awards? How do we properly and adequately celebrate recipients virtually? Um, we're planning to take what normally is a three-day series of events during our fall kickoff and stretching them out um, over several weeks from September through October. We're going to avoid 
bumping up against the November election too, since I'm sure people will have other concerns on their mind around them. Um, and it's really unfortunate that nothing can quite replace the energy of, of in-person interactions. Uh, while we're interacting fairly well online, alumni awards and donor paddle raises will just not have the same excitement and enthusiasm. And this is pretty concerning for, for all of us. Uh, we're working on what our auction for public interest stipends will look like next spring already. Um, In-person seems very unlikely at this point. We may conduct a virtual auction over a period of weeks, capped off with a short virtual live auction. Um, and then we're partnering um, with the student organization that helps run this auction. We hope to engage um, former stipend recipients, our alumni, um, with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for new stipends beginning this fall. Um, I also want to acknowledge that Zoom fatigue is all too real, so we have to try our best to make it worth our alumni and donor time to attend what we plan. So how do we honor traditional annual events and incorporate new innovative event ideas that people will actually be interested in? I believe that keeping alumni engaged shouldn't be a guessing game, and with such a small team like we have at Oregon Law, we have to be careful with our time and resources. So I want to share two tactics that we're using to help guide our planning. Um, in April, when it was becoming clear we were going to be in this for the long haul and the fall terms alumni events were really looking dicey, um, we created uh, what we've called our ad hoc digital alumni advisory committee. This committee is made up of six administrators at the law school, two of whom are actually alumni of the law school. Um, and it includes our career director, uh, one of our career directors and our diversity director. And we've also asked six other alumni to be part of this committee. One is a current Law School Alumni Association board member, and the other five are people who we view as prospective board members. So this might give us a sense of, of who's going to um, be interested in helping us out on future board service. So we convened the committee by the end of May, and it meets one to two times per month. Um, for us to vet ideas and brainstorm. They've reviewed and provided feedback for our fall kickoff series and our laundry list of other alumni engagement ideas. And to summarize what we have learned from our committee so far, um, they want online mixers with their classmates. Um, so it sounds familiar to what you've had Lillian. Um, they're really yearning for connection with each other. Um, the events can't be too long, much more than an hour is a bit rough for them. Um, Big fancy speakers are of great interest, of course. Um, they're interested in reconnecting with faculty and hearing from the dean. They're somewhat neutral about CLEs, um, but they would really like ethics cred credits. Uh, they like the idea of a book club, perhaps turning it into a podcast. I believe at, at Utah there's a, a book club with the dean, so that's awesome. Um, and they're attracted to important topics and themes to draw their attention. The other tactic we have used is surveying our donors and alumni. Um, we had to cancel our spring plans for our donor stewardship reception, um, but we really didn't know what to do instead. So we uh, asked our don donors what they wanted from us by surveying them. We used Qualtrics, which as our survey tool, um, and we learned from those donors, they, they wanted to hear from the Dean. Uh, they weren't that interested in hearing from scholarship recipients or faculty at this time. And they like the ideas of a Zoom coffee chat or a happy hour, um, so we planned both. Uh, so since we're in this Pacific time zone, the morning coffee chat donor event we held helped us capture donors from the West Coast to the East Coast, which was really nice. Uh, and even one donor zoomed in from the UK. These donors who wouldn't have been able to attend the in-person version of our stewardship, the, excuse me, these are donors who would not have been able to attend our in-person donor stewardship event at all. So we were thrilled to see them and they were thrilled to see each other too. Um, the happy hour event is a larger group of donors who are mostly from the Pacific Northwest. We asked our donors to wear school colors, green and or yellow, um, and we take screenshots of the group for social media, which they all loved. They truly felt appreciated, which of course was our goal. So while we focused on surveying our donors to help guide our development event planning, there's no reason not to survey your alumni for their preferences, thoughts, and ideas. Um, and I encourage you to take a close look at the responders of surveys for potential new volunteers, panelists, board members, and, and donors too. 
So I need to wrap up, um, but I want to say that I really believe we can um, adapt and innovate this year, that our alumni and donor bases understand and care about us, especially when we show we are caring about them too. And I remain optimistic that they will pay attention and participate. So thank you. I think Lily, I'm kicking it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. And Chris. Um, I, I'm amazed by all you guys are doing on really small teams as well. So that's inspiring. And I think we can probably all of us on this call gather some good uh, inspiration and, you know, go into the, the summer and fall uh, knowing that we're not alone in having to do a lot with small teams and get creative. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for coming. Have a good day, everyone.